If anybody's interested, this year, corporate profit has reached an all-time high. Everything is booming, and somebody was asked if it's going to get any worse. And he said, well, if the Vietnam War continues, it won't get any worse. It's the world we're living in. So I suppose it'll splash back on us a little bit of that corporate profit, and we'll have some corporate profit. But, um, well, we're talking about the Christian in the world. It's the Christian in the world now, the Christian in the world, not the monk. Basically, with this is the fundamental stuff we're talking about is, uh, basically what we're talking about is the Vatican Council and the Council's attitude towards the world, which is definitely a new attitude. And the Council is telling us that the Christian should revise to some extent his attitude toward the world and see it in a new light. And of course, this affects us as monks, and so that's what we're talking about is what is this new light. But it does not mean, just to let's get perfectly clear here, that it does, what it doesn't mean is we're not saying that we've got to go out and teach in schools and run parishes. So if anybody's worried about that way, that's not what we're saying. Um, so, uh, the basic principles we laid down last time uh, that we're talking about is that Hitherto, we have tended to regard the world as a purely hostile force, see, something totally hostile, totally different from us, from which we are completely alienated, see, with which we have somehow or other nothing to do, and then it is kind of attacking us all the time. See, we're always under attack from the world, and we always have to resist this hostile force. Now, that's, uh, nobody's saying that this is false, see. We're not talking in terms of absolute truth and absolute falsity. We're talking in terms of how you look at a thing. It is true to say that the sun moves round the earth. See, this is perfectly correct. See, that if by that you mean the sun appears to move round the earth. And from a certain point of view, if you say that the earth moves round the sun, you're incorrect from a certain point of view because uh, there are ways in which you could say that all this business of things moving around some other things is so completely relative that it just doesn't mean anything anymore. And that's one of the effects of the theory of relativity is that when you, you realize that all talk about anything moving around anything is purely a matter of appearance. See, From a certain point of view, it appears to move around this. See, So therefore, it is perfectly correct to say if you want to that the world is attacking us and so forth, just as you say, the sun rises in the morning and so it appears true and the world appears to attack us. But then you have to immediately qualify it and say, well, it doesn't appear to it. It doesn't really do this. See? There is something else at stake and it's not quite the way it looks. And it is also perfectly right and legitimate to turn around and say, well, now let's look at the world as something of which we are a part and of which we cannot be anything else but a part. And since we are part of it, we can't be separated from it. And it is, in fact, the place where we are working out our salvation. And it is where our Christian vocation has placed us. And we can, in fact, choose it. So we can say yes to it. We can uh, open up to it completely. And that is what the Church is saying. We can say that we are... Now, with the world, and we're, we're all for it, and we're all with it, and we choose it, and we say yes to it, and so forth. And so that is the point that we're working on here. But the thing that we have to remember, is, as we said last time, is the essential Christian note that comes in there and qualifies it, is that this for us is only possible insofar as the cross of Christ is at the center of our lives, and we are uh, struggling to separate what is according to love from what is not according to love. And this is a struggle, and this is always very difficult and sometimes very bitter and very rough, and that we cannot just accept all human values without distinction. They have to be tested by the cross. See? And this is what is important for Christians, which other people do not necessarily take terribly seriously, but we do, see. However, once that's been said, 
we turn and face the world without any further <clears throat> stereotype projection. See, there's a sort of an automatic rejection which we've been making for centuries. Oh, the world, no good. See, and then you immediately go on. Having rejected it with your right hand, you immediately take it back with your left, and you have you, you could be rich and all these things. All you got to do is spit on the world every once in a while. Sunday morning, you spit on it, and uh, and then the rest of the week, you fill your pockets with its with its productions. See, and you get rich and you have a wonderful time, and then all of you hate the world. See, well, this is no no longer necessary. Now, what are we talking about, uh, really? To get down to the central point, the thing I want to talk about today is this attitude towards the world as part of the education of the heart. See, <clears throat> now this isn't modern terminology at all, but still it's important for us. See, the education of the heart as Christians and as monks, and by the heart I mean uh, actually the whole person, the whole person as responding. See, we're talking about response to the world. It isn't just an attitude of looking at the world, it is an attitude of response to. And when you talk in terms of response, you can think in terms of the heart. The heart, not the organ of the heart, but that in man, which coordinates and gathers together all his, uh, uh, the understanding which is linked with love. See, uh, A response of the heart is a response of understanding which appreciates value. This is very important. This is really the key to this whole question of attitude towards the world. It's not just an intellectual attitude, see. And the idea of value comes in there as something very important. And when you get right down to this question of value, see, uh, the, the, this is really the, the, the whole thing. Is there a value in the world that we should love? Is there some, and by I say world, now I mean secular world. Is there something in secularity that should be responded to with sympathy and love? And if so, why? And if so, what is it? And how do you know it? And so forth. Well, how are you going to approach that question? Well, what's the Christian? Uh, yes, Brother Nivar? I think uh, the answer to that question is that the Christian should love all right okay and uh, from a Christian point of view I would say that the the answer that I would give would be especially what we look for in the world the value we look for in the world is the value that Christ sees in it see this I would say is there's about the best way of, look, of looking at it from a Christian point of view if we as Christians and monks look for something to value, to prize, to estimate, to love in the world. It should be that which Christ has valued and prized and loved and estimated in the world. See? And when you, get, when you say that right away, you are once again back where? At the cross. See? I mean, there are things in the world which our Lord valued so much that he died on the cross to save them. Not just uh, to separate people from the world, but that, there's, that these values should grow in the world. See? That the world should be saved, should be redeemed. Not just in the sense of sinners being pulled out of it, like men being rescued from a shipwreck. But that the whole works should be lifted up. This we have to remember. I think this is the fundamental thing. If Christ died for the world, it was because he saw a value in the world, and this is the value that we have to see. And this is precisely it. See, we have to look at the modern world and see in it what is valuable to Christ. And if we look at the modern world and say nothing is valuable in this mess to Christ, uh, well, it may sound good for a while, but in the long run we are going to be proving that we are not with Christ because he does see in the modern world something worth dying for and so forth. So therefore, uh, this education of the heart is a very important thing because in the heart, see, in the, the heart educated by Christian knowledge and Christian love, the Holy Spirit is the one who makes this evaluation. The Holy Spirit in our hearts will evaluate what is good and not good in the world. See, a spiritual man judges all things you get in the mind. So, And remember now, what we're going to be talking about, this is leading up to things like communism. See, uh, 
when I say to find some value in the world, I mean also, is there a value in communism that the Christian should see and respond to? Automatic answer, no. See, uh, all you see in communism is nothing but a target for the H-bomb. See, it's a providential target that's been put there for you, for us to use our hardware on, and it has no other purpose for existing. See, it is to be hated. See, okay. That is one of the great problems. One of the great problems of the modern world is that it's full of Christians who think like that. And it's also full of communists who think the same thing in reverse. See? It is full of people who think that way. See? Our side is right and the other side is to be destroyed. And all problems are solved when you destroy the other guy. See? Okay, this is, this is no good. And this is what's behind this question of the Christian's attitude towards world. What do you think the Pope is doing talking to that guy? See, Gromico. He's, he's, not do, he's not doing this just for fun, see. He is doing this because he thinks it's important. He thinks that there is, a, there is a real reason for being in contact with these people, see. And this is terribly important to us. He's not just doing this to a kind of a, a, kind of a stunt, you know. You get in the Archbishop of Canterbury, then you get in a red, and then after a while, you, I don't know, think of some more, other more extraordinary kind of person, get him in, see and uh, makes headlines every week. But that's not what he's trying to do. So therefore, uh, it is understood that any kind of an automatic attitude of rejection is, implies a failure of love, see? And the Christian rejects nothing that has any potential good in it, whatever. Because love demands that wherever there is good, the Christian sees it, finds it, and loves it for God's sake. So this response then to the world is going to be marked by the following qualities. It's going to be marked by truth and love, see. And this means to say that it has to be honest. Truth has to take the, the form of honesty. Now this honest reaction to the world, what is an honest reaction to the world? What is a dishonest reaction to the world? What's a dishonest reaction to anything? What would be a standard dishonest reaction? Anybody? What would be a type, a, a typically, all right, Brother Nevar, what's it? What? Probably. All right, but what does that imply? How does that work? Yeah, and I think that the thing that's important to get in there is the fact that it is a preconception. See, it is you've decided beforehand. Uh, in other words, uh, you have got in your mind a, a series of decisions already made. See, now this is not honest. I mean, supposing I meet so and so. Somebody says, I "Meet uh, Mr. So and So," and I see that he's got certain color hair or something like that. And I think all people with red hair are violent-tempered people, and I'm going to have nothing to do with this man from here on out. He is a violent-tempered man. I will avoid him. See, this is not an honest reaction. It's a dishonest reaction because it's, why it isn't really a reaction. It's not a response. See, it is a failure to respond. The refusal to respond is therefore a dishonest response. And when a person refuses to respond and then explains it in some particular way, this is most dishonest. See, so therefore now consider ourselves. See, the world something happens in the world or about the world or there's a question of something to do with the world, we have our response already, our reaction already, see? It's ready-made. You press the button and up comes the reaction and that's it. And you don't react. You don't respond, see? So many of our responses to the world are simply mechanical responses which aren't responses at all. Therefore, they're dishonest see? Insofar as, as a response maybe. I mean, you know, I, I don't have to I scream with joy when I hear the pirates are at the top of the league or whatever it is. <laughs> but uh, uh, I understand they are. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, so, all right, this is, this is something that you don't necessarily have to respond to. See. Uh, you, there's, this is not obligatory. But on the other, there are some things that I should respond to. And it should not be an automatic response. And it should not be a response dictated by somebody else if I am capable of some kind of personal response. And this is, again, a terrible thing, see, because this is one of the great problems of life today is that there are so many ready-made responses for everything. This is one of the problems of modern life, see. 
is that in the world or out of it, in the monastery or out of it, people respond in the way they've been told. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, incidentally, well, let's. Yeah. Well, since we're talking, since we brought that up, this this senatorial election. <laughs> let me tell you something. This, this senatorial election this fall is going to be very important. And John Sherman Cooper is running, who is one of the best men we have in this state, and he is running on a very uh, hard-hitting kind of platform, and he has things that he is opposed to in the government's policies in Vietnam, stuff like that. In case you want to know, he is very much against the Vietnam War and is running on that platform of being against the war. See, And uh, there is a big... Well, there's, there's a lot of, of stuff. This is a very controversial issue at the moment. And if you want to vote for somebody who is doing something, vote for Cooper in this uh, election. And everybody who's around Kentucky knows that Cooper makes some sense. See, Co Cooper is a good man. So that's all I know about this polls election, but I can tell you at least that. See, that Cooper is coming. Whenever Cooper comes up, he's a good man to vote for. Who these other guys are, I don't know. I mean, if it comes to... If it, if it comes to to voting for Schnickelschnitz for dog catcher or something like that. I mean, I, I couldn't care. I don't vote for those people. See, personally, I don't vote. I don't even go if I don't know who they are. I don't go near the place. There's no point. Why ride over to that school? It's nice to see the kids playing in the schoolyard. <laughs> this, this, this is a contact with the world which I find exhilarating. And so I will go over there, watch the kids play in the schoolyard, and then ride back. But, but there's no particular point in voting for, for these guys for dog catcher or for uh, I'm a jailer and that sort of stuff, especially since we're not, well. <laughs> another, dis another form of dishonest response. A dishonest response, the kind of dishonest response which a person makes very frequently in religion is instead of uh, you, you choose for what is not disturbing, see, instead of facing the necessity of a disturbing situation, see, I have to face the fact that this man is dead drunk and he is my uncle. <laughs> and I've got to get him into the building somehow before he, you know, before he's run over or something like this. See, I can say, well, I never saw this guy. <laughs> I leave it out there in the middle of all the trucks. See. Uh, this is a disturbing situation that calls for a response of some sort. See, but now we have a tendency to avoid these things that, that call for something disturbing, and simply to prefer our own peace. And this, you can run down the line with things like this. Uh, the, the race issue. See, this. Well, this is a very disturbing, nasty mess. See. Well, maybe it's just a distraction. See, maybe I might, I'll just keep my peace and forget about it. I can't do anything about it anyway, so let's just forget it. See, this is not honest. See, there comes a time when a person has to decide. And in making his decision, he may be in anguish for a long time. See, now I would say this, that it would be a, a most important thing in the Christian's reaction to the world today of having to face anguished decisions over a long period of time, not being able to get a decent answer for a long period of time. See, I would say it's most important that we should not regard this as distracting. We may have to be in positions where over long periods our peace is disturbed because we don't know the answer and we are trying to find the answer and we can't find it and we have to struggle to make up our minds and we can't make them up. And it would be so nice if we could make up our minds and forget the whole thing and go pray nice and quiet. And we can't, see. It is a dishonest solution simply to reject this in order to have peace. We must not do this. We are not allowed to do this as Christians if it is something important. I mean, there are other things that you can just put out of your mind. They're just simply nonsense and so forth. Well, okay, put them out of your mind. But there are certain big things that you have to struggle with. You have to sweat them out. And we have to learn to sweat these things out and realize that it is important to sweat them out. And it's more important to do that than to have peace. See? So this, I would say, is another very important principle. 
And then, of course, if our response to the world is going to be true, it has to be based on genuine knowledge, which gets back to that same old question, see. And I'm not, it's not for me to, to sit up here and say how we're going to get knowledge of the world and that sort of thing. I mean, I'm giving the principles and then the, the application is other somebody else's business. It's not my business. But nevertheless, if you are going to have an honest reaction to the world, it implies knowledge of the world. It implies some genuine knowledge of the world. And it's the superior's responsibility to see to what extent he thinks should you get this knowledge and that sort of stuff. But it ha there has to be a genuine knowledge of some sort of the world. And this implies, I would say, a healthy curiosity about the world. A healthy curiosity up to a certain point and in a certain area. See? And I, I would say that uh, whatever may be the drawbacks of our life, we have a library in which now a healthy curiosity can be exercised with profit. See? I mean, it isn't, you, you can't exercise it consistently on everything, but there are certain areas there where you can find out a, a certain amount about what is going on. I would say, for example, a healthy curiosity about science would be something very important in a monk, see. Don't be afraid to read the Scientific American if you can understand it. I can't. <laughs> I mean, most of those articles are, are lost on me. I, mean, I, I, I read the first page and I get to the first uh, equation and I've had it. <laughs> this, this is all fun for certain types of people, like Bartholomew. There you lap this up. See, this, this is recreation. But, but for me, it's uh, since I failed every math course I ever took in my life, <laughs> But I like the little snippets of general information that they give about somebody's digging a tunnel 50,000 miles long under Mount Everest or something like that. I always like that. But there should be this healthy curiosity about the world. And um, again, we should respond sympathetically to that which the world values in itself. See, Now this is an important point, and the Vatican Council brought this up. See, Now what does the modern world value in itself? There are certain things which the modern world values in itself, which are which we should value. Which what are some of the characteristic things? We shouldn't just spit on them. What are they? What are, what what does the world value in itself? Yes, but okay. Expression. Sure, sure. That of course, actually, we had in the refectory there was something read about that recently, uh, putting that forward as a secular value. I don't think that's just a plain secular value, really. I think that is something more than just purely secular, but they are now treating that as a secular value, as something that was developed in secular society, but I think that's a little ambiguous. Yes? That's, that comes under the same heading. See, this, is a, this isn't a purely secular value. This is also a spiritual value, a, really, a Christian value. This is a Christian value in itself, but say something like, yes? Well, uh, ethical, now it's called ethical conduct. Well, that's, that's above it again. That's again on, on this higher level. Well, what's something just on a plain old, dirty old materialistic money. level? What? Money. Well, money. <laughs> we could do a lot of good with it. There's a lot you can do with money. That's true. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. The, say e economics. Say economic development. Let's put it that way. I mean, what you can do with the economic uh, resources that we have put it that way, then this is important. See, the fact that you can make something out of uh, what we have at hand, we can develop wealth, this is important. Why is it important? Not for the sake of developing wealth, but for the sake of feeding people. See, uh, There are in the world these immense resources which could be used and which the world is proud of. It doesn't have a right to be proud of the way it's using it all the time, because, I mean, like I say, here we are with the highest level of corporate profit. But more and more and more, the wealth of this country is being uh, concentrated in the hands of something like 15 or 20 corporations. See? And you stop and think, this is a monopoly economy. See? Strictly monopoly. Which means to say that the money is getting more and more in the hands of few people. And this is, this is not something to be <laughs> delighted about. This is bad. Because the, where money is concentrated in the hands of a few people, power is concentrated in the hands of a few people, and when the interests of these people demands that certain things appear to the general public to be other than they are, then they appear to the general public to be other than they are. And this affects the whole thing down the line, our decisions and so forth about things. Okay. 
Uh, technological development is another one. See, technology is something that the world is, is proud of. And all right, we should, we should uh, value this. There is nothing wrong in valuing the great potential that there is in the world for development, things of this kind. Uh, or just even take some things like sport, so forth. See, sport has a, there is a certain value to it. I would say it is, it's, it's, it's better if you're participating rather than just sitting around and watching. See, but there is something to sport. I don't say that we have to be, again, uh, breaking our necks to find out who won this or that, but I mean, if, you know, that there's, uh, athletics are good. See, not necessarily for us. I mean, they're, they're, they're just in time around here for touch football and so forth. It'd be nice. We could play it. But, uh, and not necessary, but, but it's a good thing, see? And we should appreciate this. You know, if you got a, got a nephew that's a good football player, we'll be glad you got a football player in the family. It's a good thing to have, see? It's not something you have to spit on. And then you miserable football player, you disgrace to the family, <laughs> so forth. A lot better to be doing that than doing some of the other things that they do. Incidentally, one of the things that's, that's going on outside now is this, a very big problem, uh, is this tremendous proliferation of the use of this drug called LSD, which is a uh, a hallucinatory drug. These kids are all taking this drug that gives you visions and experiences. They get high on LSD, which is very cheap and can be a, a smart high school chemistry student can make it himself, see. And all these, for example, one kid got himself some LSD and this is tasteless, colorless, and so forth and so forth. And he, he soaked a lump of sugar in it and put it in the icebox to take later on. And his little sister took it and nearly went nuts, see. And uh, people are going out of their mind taking this junk, kids taking this stuff, and college students taking this stuff. And there was a man in Harvard who was promoting this as, as a way of promoting. I mean, there are a bunch of divinity students in a Protestant seminary took uh, they, they had an experiment on a Good Friday service. It had to be Good Friday, of course. Uh, half of them took LSD and half took just plain stuff, and nobody knew who had what. And then they so it turned out that the ones who had the LSD all had visions. See, so they thought this proved something. I don't know what they thought it proved, but anyway, I guess it proved that if you take LSD, you can have a vision. But uh, this is this is a very dangerous thing because it's being used irresponsibly. See, there are something like 10 or 15 magazines devoted to the cult of this kind of stuff, see. And they're tying it in with all sorts of weird uh, non-Christian mystical cults like Tibet, the Tibetan Book of the Dead and so forth. They've tied this in with LSD and you get some real weirdy visions, you know. <laughs> and uh, this is what's going on. And, and Bobby Kennedy is right now running a campaign against this. See, and they've got it off the market, but the kids can make it, see. And uh, this is a great problem. Uh, this is not a value. See, that here, here you've got in the world a perversion of a genuine instinct, the, the instinct to, to see the spiritual things and to the kind of instinct that brings people to a place like this to develop their interior life. Now, you don't have to be a mug. See, just get a little bit of this junk, put, d dip a lump of sugar in it, and eat it. you got a vision. You don't have to bother about praying or any of that kind of stuff. You don't give up anything or be good, any of that junk. Just have to take a little bit of this stuff. <laughs> but the thing about it is, that from what I have seen of the people, I know some people who have taken it, and as far as I can see, all they get is what we get when we're doing good, you know. I mean, we can get pretty high too sometimes, and all they get is, is you know, when you're, when you're really groovy, see. <laughs> And you're really, you know, things are kind of popping, and you can see this. You can really see, well, that's, that's all you get with LSD. And we have to work for it a little bit. You have to, <laughs> you have to sweat. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you have to sort of get down and pray and that kind of stuff and be pretty good for a while. And then a feast day comes along, and then you get the lights, you know. <laughs> so I'd much rather do it that way. There's a certain amount of satisfaction attached to the fact that, that you at least worked for it. <clears throat> But you'll find in, the, in, a, in probably a generation or two, they'll be giving this stuff out in the refectory. You <laughs> <laughs> can get LSD for relief. <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, I think you could do just as well on scotch. <laughs> so, 
personally, if, if, if it, I, I would like to go on record and say now that if it gets to a choice between LSD and scotch, give me scotch. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's more fun to begin with, and you could, you could make it fun. You could string it out. You just can't take 15. <laughs> you can't take 15 or 20 glasses of LSD with scotch. You can go on all day. So, uh, love implies openness to the world, openness to the viewpoint of the world. Now, this is a very important point. I don't know if we're going to be able to develop this, but hitherto, Christians have regarded the world in the following way. We have said, we will serve the world insofar as the world agrees with us, and our first service to the world will therefore consist in making the world see things our way. See, And this has kind of been a presupposition. Our first duty to the world is to make them agree with us first. Then after that, we'll think, we'll think about the other stuff. But first, they got to see things our way. Today, this has been radically changed. And I think it's an important point. Today, Christians of all kinds, from the Catholic Church on down through the Protestants and so forth, are saying, let them be the world. Let them be secular. Let them be thoroughly secular. And even if they don't agree with us, we're going to serve them anyway. This, I think, is a progress. See? Uh, what, what this means is acceptance of the secular world as secular. This, I think, is one of the important points. And I think it's important for us. Because it is no longer realistic for us to be rejecting the secular world because it's secular. With the implication that once it comes around to see things our way, we're going to agree with it and we'll play along. But as long as they don't, we are simply going to despise them, see. This is useless. We, because the world is, is secular and it's going to stay secular. And there's not an awful lot we are going to be able to do about this, see. And if there is anything that we are going to be able to do about it, it is by being Christians who accept this and can dialogue with the secular world on its own terms. Because this other attitude has consisted in refusing to speak to the secular world in any other terms except our own. And this is something that simply does not work, see. So therefore, what does it mean to accept the secularity of the secular world? It doesn't mean to say that we buy their ideas and make them our own, but it does mean that we accept the secularity of the world as a basis for conversation, see. In other words, I accept the atheist as atheist, see. I do not demand that he stop being an atheist or potentially uh, reject his atheism before I will talk to him. I will talk to him insofar as he is an atheist.